Okay, so this is my first case. Um, this patient came for pelvic pain and they're postmenopausal, um, but we saw this uterine abnormality. So you can see that there's two endometrial cavities. There's this thing in between them. It goes all the way down through the cervix to the external cervical os. Um, we couldn't really see if there was anything in the vagina like a vaginal septum, which I find would be very hard to see on MRI. Um, but what do people think about this? Do they think it's a bicornuate, a didelphus, a septate? I agree with somebody who just texted. Yeah, so, so Gathanjali and Kedar say septate, exactly. Complete, complete though, right? Down through the cervix. Yeah, exactly. So when I first saw this, I was thinking like didelphus or bicornuate, bicolis. Um, and I thought there was like a fibroid up here. And so I kind of dismissed it as like that the fibroid was creating that. Um, which I, and then there's another fibroid here. So I think it's like a little tricky, but generally the outer contour looks like it is, um, it's fully intact here. There's no divot here. So what you're looking for is like a one centimeter divot um, and that these horns are about four centimeters apart in order to say that it's a bicornuate. Um, and I'll just show you the post-contrast images. This doesn't necessarily change anything, but um, you can see the two endometrial cavities. You can see the fibroid there. Um, oh, I don't know why it's not scrolling through. But anyway, um, it did look like the either the fibroid or the outer contour was there. So just a couple of quick points about um, septate and bicor uh, bicornuate. So septate is about 55% of uterine anomalies and it has the highest rate of pregnancy loss. Um, so that's, this would be a septate. So the outer contour is smooth. Um, you don't have that one centimeter divot at the top here. Um, the septum can be either fibrous or muscular and it can extend all the way down through the cervix to the outer os, which is kind of what we think is happening in my case. Um, they have pregnancy loss because this septum is usually poorly vascularized. And so if you, um, implant on here, it could lead to miscarriage, and they can treat it hysteroscopically by resecting the septum. A bicornuate um, has a muscular kind of septum here between the two horns, and so it has a much lower rate of pregnancy loss. You'll have that 10 millimeter divot, and about 25% of these will, will have a vaginal septum, so that can actually affect um, fertility. And then in a didelphus, um, which goes all the way down and can be hard to distinguish from a bicornuate, bicolis, and a didelphus, they actually have a 75% rate of having a vaginal septum. So we were thinking this case um, was probably a septate, as you guys said. Um, so if this patient wasn't uh, postmenopausal, maybe they would treat it by, um, by resecting this entire septum. Okay, my next case is this one. Um, so the patient has a neuroendocrine tumor and they were coming up for follow-up. And we only did one phase, um, this venous phase. And you can see we were thinking that this was like focal fat along the falciform ligament. And then we saw this rounded lesion up here. So do you guys, what do you guys think about this lesion up here? It wasn't seen on a, a, a prior exam. Or let's just say we don't have any prior exams. And you see this lesion here. Um, and then we're on the venous phase and we see our focal fat over here. What do you guys think? Not highly suspicious, kind of indeterminate though. Okay, so Steve says highly suspicious, but indeterminate. No, no, not. I don't, I don't, think, it, I don't think it is highly suspicious. Okay, okay. I, think I was thinking like when I initially saw this, like maybe it is a neuroendocrine met that has already enhanced and kind of washed out. Um, Tarun is saying fat. Good. Good yeah, thought. I'm thinking maybe focal fat or, or a flow phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It looked kind of rounded. It looks separate from this focal fat. We didn't know, should we clump it with the fat? What should we do? Should we even recommend an MRI? But um, MRI. luckily, what'd you say? Oh, you didn't need to do the MRI. Where did that come from? <laughs> so this was a prior exam and it was actually like, you know, in the arterial phase. And you can see they've got that huge focal hepatic hotspot along the falciform. And they also, you can even see where basically these are collateral vessels in the abdominal wall that are going through our veins of sappy and the focal hotspot, and then going through this vein and shunting over through the middle, middle hepatic vein to the IVC. So it's basically a systemic shunt going through the liver because the SVC was occluded. 
Um, in this case, this patient had like a tumor up in their mediastinum. So if you see this hot spot along with collateral vessels, you should think about um, a uh, SPC occlusion. Um, but the cool part too here is that not only is it along the veins of SAPI, but it is up here where our hypodensity was on the other scan. So we now know that that focal hepatic hotspot um, could look like this on the venous phase. And I guess one of my teaching points here is that like, okay, just because we see it on the venous phase doesn't mean it's not perfusional, because in this case it is perfusional. And on MRI, you might even see an abnormality on like the T1 pre or even the T2. And I think my theory is that if you have a big enough perfusional abnormality, it'll, the liver is actually different in that area. And then my other theory is that this isn't necessarily fat because often if you look even here on MRI, it's not actually fat. It's just like perfusional stuff. What do other people think? Any other? We, I mean, we've called these things focal fat for years. And then somewhere along the line, it got proved that they're not, uh, although some of them are. <laughs> and, yeah. And I agree that, I agree that it, it's probably a flow phenomenon that may, uh, contribute to the development of steatosis in the region sometimes, but it's probably just more underlying flow phenomenon that's going on in that area because of the venous uh, outflow that can happen. And so, yeah, exactly. So Ummer is asking, what should we recommend if there was no prior ultrasound or MRI? Um, personally, I don't think the ultrasound will clear it because you might not see it at all. So if you are concerned, I would probably say MRI, and then you'd probably see that it looks just like the, um, the other focal fat area. Um, I do have a little um, slide about this. So this is uh, what we call third inflow. And so there's all these areas that you get third inflow in your liver that lead to these perfusion abnormalities. So these veins of sapi are the ones that are the typical kind of focal hepatic hotspot. Um, but there's other areas like the superior veins of savvy, sapi, um, this is a nice area over here in the left lateral sector um, from an aberrant left gastric vein. And then this kind of shows you why you often get those perfusion abnormalities. Um, one is an aberrant right gastric vein near the portal hilum and then the cholecystic veins going um, into the liver here. So we often see like areas of perfusion abnormality, maybe focal fat, maybe fatty sparing. And they're because of all of these aberrant third um, veins that are coming through the liver surface. So the first inflow is the portal vein, the second inflow is the hepatic artery, and then the third inflow is all of these other veins that are draining into the liver from the outside. That's a I really like diagram. This. Where'd you get her from? <laughs> from a Japanese uh, article here. But um, it's, yeah, it's the first time I kind of understood like how many different veins are flowing here. So sometimes you'll actually see the focal hepatic hotspot here, or like it could be anywhere because basically any vein that decided to like flow through can, can um, cause that kind of shunting. But yeah, these are the kind of like classic ones. Um, okay, and then this is my next case. This is just like a quick little show and tell. So um, this patient, they have a pericardial effusion, pleural effusions. They have these very atrophic kidneys with cortical calcifications. Um, all these other calcifications. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this to me was like the most kind of calcification I've ever seen in somebody's skin before. And uh, Githanjali is calling it calcinosis cutis. Cool. I basically just called it metastatic calcification from renal failure. Um, but it was, yeah, it was kind of interesting to me that um, they did have some others like at the lung bases and stuff like that. So um, just a couple of points about this metastatic calcification. It's not malignant um, and it's just called metastatic because it's like in weird places. Um, but uh, basically- I hate that terminology because it confuses people. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so this is my patient. But anyway, this is metastatic calcification of renal disease. It's actually due to a phosphate problem. So the kidneys can't um, process their phosphate normally. And so you get hyperphosphatemia and then it leads to like with or without calcemia. And over a long time, you can deposit in all these places. Um, one of the classic places is in the lungs. And actually early on, you might get these kind of like ground glass opacities. It might not even look like very, very calcified. 
And then over time, you might actually see and perceive the calcifications, um, especially like along the, the pleural surfaces. And actually it can be reversed if they get like a transplant or dialysis, or if it was due to parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, then you could do a pyrothyroidectomy. Um, in very rare occasions, the, the hypercalcinosis actually can cause pulmonary failure. But I think in the skin, it doesn't really cause, cause anything. And I did not know this term, calcinosis cutis, cool. And my last case, actually, for some reason I can't transfer ultrasounds over well, but anyway, this is my last case. This was a postmenopausal patient. Her endometrium, you can see, is up to like 35 millimeters. She was having postmenopausal bleeding. So, I mean, this is a much more obvious case than like sometimes we have borderline cases. Um, usually, I think for postmenopausal bleeding, we have a cutoff of up to like five millimeters unless they're on tamoxifen, in which case you can go up to eight millimeters. Um, this one obviously is like 35 millimeters. We saw all this like echogenic material with blood products in here. That echogenic stuff, that soft tissue thickening of the endometrium had flow in it. Um, so they ended up doing an endometrial biopsy, and this came back um, carcinosarcoma of the uterus. So I just looked up a couple of things about carcinosarcoma because I wasn't sure if that meant that it was coming from the endometrium or from the myometrium. But turns out carcinoma, sarco carcinosarcoma is actually more related to endometrial cancer than it is a sarcoma of the uterus. But um, in the PATH, you'll see both of these. So you'll see like epithelial cells that have carcinoma, and you'll also see sarcoma either of myometrial origin or of some other tissue. It's really rare, um, it's aggressive, and about 10% have METS on presentation. And so you might, um, one question that I often think of like, why don't they get like full body staging of these patients? And just like for ovarian cancer, they basically stage them surgically. So um, they'll, if they see this and they have the diagnosis, they'll basically go do a hysterectomy and then stage, do their whole um, omentectomy and um, cytoreduction um, all surgically. And then these are some of the risk factors. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, Nelly or Gitanjali? Yeah, I can. Oh, okay. Nelly can go first. Um, okay. Hey, can you see my case? Or um, my screen? Yes. Cool. Um, so this is a patient, 85 years old, I think, or some older patient um, with history of HHT. Came coming in with abdominal pain. What do you guys think? The esophagus looked thickened, but I see some huge like retroperitoneal collaterals. Yes. Okay, what, right there. What do you guys think about the bowel? Proximal small bowel looks a little thickened and hyperemic. I hate to overcall that, but uh, it catches my eye. Yeah, including the duodenum. Mm -hmm. Definitely right a duodenum looks not that bad. So what are you guys gonna say? I still can't tell See, where the, can you, I don't know, you're, the scrolling is skipping a little bit for me, but um, the stuff that's draining into the IVC, where is that connected to? Is that connected to the SMV or? I think it's going into the IVC here. I see a drainage, draining vein here. She has HHT, so this is, I think, part of that. Okay. Gitanjali says vasculitis. Um, of, of I've seen such a pattern with SLE vasculitis, but I can't put yeah. the bowel and the HHT thing together. No, that I can't put together. Um, so what are you going to say the bowel findings are due to? And would you recommend anything? I probably would have said like non-specific enteritis. Or I guess, 
I can trace where those, because that looks like a huge SMV there and a huge ileocolic. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be ischemia because there's good upper GI circulation by looks of it. Um, if I'm please saying chronic low grade ischemia, I guess also you could be like venous vascular congestion. Yeah, so this um, this turned out to be ischemic bowel. Um, and it was felt to be due to underlying vasculitis disease from the HHT. And I think this is a challenging case because this is not the typical location for ischemic bowel, the duodenum, proximal jejunum. Um, and I, I'm showing that case, this case because of that, because it doesn't follow our typical pattern, but I think because of her underlying HHT, um, she's at risk. And I think, um, you know, the idea of maybe chronic low-grade ischemia um, is, you know, very good. They did an endoscopy and, I mean, the bowel was dead. Uh, so I, it was just a hard case and something for people to keep in mind. Nellie, um, did you see like any beating of the arteries? Like I thought I might see something in the jejunal area, but I didn't, I can't really tell. Um, I'm not sure. Let me direct me for, to where For like I vasculitis, right? Right, like there, yeah, for vasculitis. Yeah. Although I can't really tell at this, like what, what's veins versus arteries here, but like even all those little things in the right lower quadrant, do you say like they look kind of squiggly? Not the, yeah. not the actual sure. veins, but no, you just, anyway. There's nothing that you thought you definitely saw was like beaded. No, I didn't think it was beaded. I don't, I mean, even looking at the areas that I see now, I don't think the vessels look beaded, but maybe it's like a microvasculitis. I don't know. I don't know. This was and is, um, is vasculitis generally associated with HHT? I don't know much about it. Um, I, um, I'll look it up and I'll get back to you. I, I, during the discussion, I think it was felt that maybe there was some kind of like underlying HHT predisposition leading to this ischemia, given it's a typical location um, for ischemic bowel. Um, unsatisfying, sorry. Um, okay. And the ischemia may be because of the shunting of the blood, like these may represent, like these are collaterals and the sh shunting of the blood so there's not much enough that makes sense. to the capillary bed of the bowel and yeah that um, makes usually sense. this pattern is seen with small vessel like the not even the arteries the capillaries that have reached um, the mucosa and the submucosal area uh -huh. and if there is inflammation of those smaller vessels which they can only see it on microscopy and there's no way that we can see it on uh, imaging um, can result in this appearance of the bowel I mean, I have two cases of SLE vasculitis. I can I can pull it up um, for next conference, and they look exactly like this. Oh, really? Oh, I want to see them. Yeah. And typical duodenal and proximal jejunal involvement. Oh, really? Oh, I want to see them. Maybe. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll bring it up next week. Awesome. Yeah, this one. Nelly, I did. Um, I found an article about HHT and GI yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and one thing they said is that they get a lot of telangiectasias because HHT is the former Osler Weber Rendu. Uh -huh. And so they get GI bleeding from a lot of telangiectasias um, and, and can be mistaken for angiodysplasia. It doesn't specifically say vasculitis yet, but. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, this is um, a patient with splenic. Do you guys think? Um, possibly lymphoma. The low density stuff, Gitanjali is also saying lymphoma. The low density stuff almost looks like treated lymphoma, like the, like the more confluent soft tissue outside of the spleen. Yeah. Um, so this was another case that kind of like was, um, we're still sort of like unclear about. Uh, so this low de this mass was resected, um, and the spleen was resected as well. The spleen came back as hemangiomatosis, splenic hemangiomatosis, and this came back as hematoma. There is no evidence of malignancy, um, and the patient had a follow-up post-op. 
Millie, I had a case just like that and we thought it was like a gist mm -hmm. or like a partially he hemorrhagic gist and it came, it was all hematoma. Wow. It's all like involuting. It's crazy. It was so crazy. So this, the, this is splenectomy and the resection of that mass. And then this was a post-op patient came back with abdominal pain. Um, so there's, you know, all this low density stuff. Um, and it was going up um, the inter lobar fissure and it looks kind of like scalloping appearance to me. Um, and there's also this low density stuff in the submucosa of the um, stomach. So what do you guys think? Did they say they like scooped out all of the hematoma in the OR? Um, I think they did as much as they could, but I think there are certain areas that are not really accessible. And, and yes, like, does that stuff that's in the fissures of the liver, is it similar to before? Or you think um, it's just something- so I'm gonna show you the before. Bending. So this is the before. So the inter interlumbar fissure lobulation, I think is new compared to pre-op, because here's a pre-op. Hmm. Right there, it's clean. So Amr is saying dilated lymphatics. Which you think could be possible. Is there any way that they missed a mucinous tumor that had a lot of blood in it, but there was like, did they test it for mucin or? Um, there was, um, you know, I have to look up the pathology report, but we, I reached out to the pathologist and there was no cancer. Hmm. Tarun is saying lymphatic. Mucin or any other sort. Um, so the, um, so between the patient after the operation, um, the patient had a surgical drain and they sent the drain image out for uh, amylase. Um, and they came back at 7,500. Um, so the presumptive diagnosis right now is that all of this new low density stuff is all sequelae of pancreatitis. And this area of low density within the submucosa is ectopic pancreatic breast. <laughs> or pancreatic juice that is just dissected into the gastric wall. Correct. Um, and I think there's a case for um, ectopic pancreatic because I think it was there preoperatively, just less pronounced. Um, mm. So you think maybe that's, maybe that's what caused the hematoma, like pancreatitis of that? I ectopic think so. I mean, that, that's the best that we have so far. Um, and when I first saw that post-operative case, um, I was really worried because it looked, kind of had that scalloping appearance. And my sort of taken point was that you, um, pancreatitis can have that appearance and this is, it can go into these spaces. And so if we see this, then this is something that we should consider. I, I thought this was malignancy. Um, and I was so kind of like confused when, when you know, I saw the path and stuff. Cool. Yeah. We had a recent case that was um, like, patient didn't have any prior imaging and it looked like they had like peritoneal carcinomatosis. But yeah. it was basically all just fat necrosis, I, I believe, from pancreatitis. And oh, they did really? have like an outside hospital diagnosis of having pancreatitis. So yeah, even just like the fat necrosis can be very nodular and yeah. mimic malignancy. That's it for me. Gitanjali, are you ready? Yeah, I can show my cases. Okay, can you all see the images? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, this is a CT, a 72-year-old male who presented to ED with sudden onset uh, epigastric pain a week ago and then persistent nausea and vomiting since then. And no other significant past medical history. Just get rid of the measurements. These are the axial contrast enhanced CT. This is the, these are the coronal images. 
any thoughts on what this could be? I have the MR, they did a MR for further evaluation of this. There's like compression of the mid distal duodenum by some high high density stuff. Maybe um, there's a, something's rounded like a mass. Remember's that in the hematometer saying duodenal hematoma. Narrowed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll show the MR the images. Hematoma? Yeah. Yeah. So this was a yeah a duodenal hematoma. There we have a crescentic soft tissue along the descending portion of the duodenum and. Uh, I think this, the crescentic shape was the clue. It really didn't look very hyperdense because the patient had one week history. So I think the blood products probably have evolved by then. But we have this uh, nice crescentic collection along the duodenum. It looks like a fluid collection on these coronal T2 images. Um, like I had kept all these post contrast images here. Uh, it has this, um, I think, uh, and they've described this ring sign for diurnal hematomas. Um, there was just two cases in uh, radiology that were reported many years back and they described this as the ring sign. I think I'll show you the more classic images, but uh, is there, you just get what is uh, the different layered appearance from different stages of hemorrhage and then peripheral rim of enhancement from granulation tissue around the hematoma and it shows restricted diffusion as hematoma shows. And this was the most diagnostic image. This was a pre-contrast even fat set, and it shows all these uh, areas of hemorrhage and a lobular pattern. Is patient on anticoagulation? Yes, that's a good question to ask. That's exactly what we asked, but this patient was not on anticoagulation and they worked him up and uh, his, uh, all the blood work was normal. He didn't have any past medical history, but treated him conservatively and... Um, This is the follow-up CT after a couple months. And, oh no, I brought up the same CT. And it completely resolved. So he was just treated conservatively with nasogastric decompression, tube feeds, um, and he recovered completely from it. So it was just a case of spontaneous diurnal hematoma. Uh, diurnum is a good location for spontaneous bubble hemorrhage. Uh, bubble hemorrhage, there are two types, uh, traumatic and spontaneous. Traumatic are the ones that we typically see with seat belt injuries, your chance fractures, pancreatic and diurnal injuries. And uh, even in pediatric population, non-accidental injury, diurnal hematomas um, have a high incidence. Uh, and spontaneous diurnal uh, hematomas, there are several reasons why they say that this is a good location because uh, there is good blood supply to, uh, in the submucosal space here. And at the same time, the diurnal is a fixed structure, so it doesn't have the capability to tamponade any hemorrhage that happens. So uh, that's why diurnum is a good location for spontaneous hemorrhage. As I said, uh, I can't show my presentation here, but uh, in radiology many years back, they had two case reports that they had described and they came up with this ring sign on MR imaging, which is just, just this layered appearance of the hematoma and cross-sectional uh, images. And some of the complications associated with it are that it can result in, if it's more in small bowel, it can result in intersusception. And as in this case, it can cause um, gastric outlet obstruction. I think that's how this patient presented uh, outlet obstruction. And that's why he had so much of nausea and vomiting and just treated conservatively. So that was- Anjali, so I have two questions. Is this- Yes. To me, it almost looks like it's outside of the duodenum. Are you saying yes. um, that it was like sub, probably submucosal vessels that bled and that kind of like ruptured through the wall and then kind of like in a contained fashion? Or do you think this whole thing is in the wall or what? Yeah, so uh, spontaneous uh, small bowel hemorrhage, a most common location is the submucosal vessels. But for duodenum, they say that it can happen anywhere. It can be intraluminal, it can be submucosal, it can be periluminal, and it can be a retroperitoneal hemorrhage from these leaky duodenal vessels. So it can leak out too. So for duodenum, you can see hematoma at any level, basically intraluminal within the wall or outside the wall. Okay. And then um, it seems like this one, in order to keep that shape like that, it must be like somewhere between the muscle and the like serosa or something like that. Yes. And I think the important thing here is to not to miscall this as a mass so that they like will do some aggressive thing. Uh, but we did MR to um, tissue for better tissue characterization and then you could tell it's a hematoma. Like you don't want to biopsy this. And... Okay. 
Yeah, another thing not to miss too would be like a GDA pseudo aneurysm that was affiliated with it or something. Yes, and yeah, I mean, we didn't have any pseudo aneurysm here, but yes, yeah, we should look for all the vascular stuff too. Okay, um, my next one is a quick one. It's just a, again a show and tell case. Uh, so a young female uh, who was being worked up for uh, chronic uh, iron deficiency anemia. And these are the images from MR andrography because I think because of anemia, they were trying to look for any GI source of bleeding. And this was the appearance of the kidneys. Yeah, I think Amar is spot on. This was a case of PNH. Uh, but there are two more causes which give rise to, this is uh, renal hemosidrosis, uh, T2 hypointensity of the renal cortex. So any form of intravascular uh, hemolysis um, causes deposition of hemosiderin. Uh, basically, the hemosiderin gets from intravascular hemolysis gets into the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidneys. And that's why the cortex looks dark on imaging. So uh, basically, whenever you have this appearance and there is no hemosidrosis elsewhere, the liver is fine, the spleen is fine, all other, like the bone marrow signal is fine. When you have isolated renal hemosidrosis, uh, the cause is intravascular hemolysis and uh, so seen with uh, prosthetic uh, cardiac valves, when there is shearing of the RBCs along those prosthetic cardiac valves, um, second cause is PNH and the third cause is sickle cell. And sickle cell we can exclude because the spleen looks normal and those sickle cell cases, the marrow is abnormal and spleen is small and shrunken. Um, so the two uh, things left were um, prosthetic cardiac valve and PNH. So she was young, she didn't have any cardiac history and she was worked up and she was found to have PNH, uh, which is a rare hemolytic disorder, but uh, not a, a good prognosis because there's not much uh, treatment options available for this condition. Uh, I think there's one drug that has recently FDA has approved for PNH treatment and this is one of those mon monoclonal antibodies known as Solaris is the brand name, and I think it's called Equalizumab. Cool. Can it reverse the hemosiderosis or basically just stops the, or you don't know? Uh, yeah, so the risk in these patients is from intravascular thrombosis. That's what causes symptoms on those patients. And this drug just prevents extra uh, thrombosis in those patients, but it doesn't reverse any of those hemosiderosis pattern or deposition of iron in the organs. And the iron deficiency anemia, you think it's because of the iron deposition here or just overall iron imbalance from renal failure? Uh, so she still not reached the stage of renal failure. Uh, I think it was more from just intravascular hemolysis. Got it. That's all I had. So stop sharing screen. Those were awesome. Anyone else have cases? Otherwise, we're going to call it. Well, that was all happening. I just did a consult. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't very. It was it's recorded, like, so you can reference it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Steve, we'd love to see them next time. Make, uh, make sure they're anonymized. And I'm going to stop the recording, actually. No, we're not those cases.